What's up, Prime Fam? What's going on, guys? As always, Brendan Tito, owner coach here at Prime Strength in today's episode six of the Prime Cast. Now, as you can see, Chris and Sheely is not with us. Uh, she had to go to an appointment. So this week's uh, podcast episode is going to be a little different. Now, if you're new here, what we usually do is we break down the latest research on, you know, strength training, powerlifting, bodybuilding, any topic concerning, you know, getting jacked, getting more strong. And then we kind of have some banter back and forth between us about various topics. Now, this week, because Kristen's not with us, I decided to just do a Q&A instead. I figured I would put it out there, ask on YouTube what you guys wanted answered. And so I'm going to go through a huge list of questions. We got 49 comments on this uh, in total. So I think 48 if you exclude my comments on this that I pinned at the top. So we got some really good questions. I'm going to answer as many of them as I can. We're going to try to go in order of the most important based on what got the most thumbs up and whoever commented kind of first and whichever questions I feel can help the most people. We got topics covering the conjugate method, what I think about it and recovery on, um, you know, certain lifts. Like, is it true that, you know, lifts or muscles only recover every, you know, 72 hours or whatever that is. We got questions about um, the deadlift with mixed grip and hook grip. We got questions about, um, we got a lot of questions on conjugate method. We got questions on Greg Doucette's opinion on our RPE, which you might be shocked what I have to say about that. Um, we got questions about caloric deficit and how to program around a very significant one. Um, all sorts of things about off season training with comp movements, as well as like what to do when you come back from an extended layoff due to COVID. Um, if you need a belt and if so, when should you start using one? When's a good time to get a coach? Is there such thing as getting a coach too early in powerlifting? We got some really good questions. So I'm going to go through all of these, uh, and I'm going to try to answer as many of them as possible, but I want to do them justice. I really want to answer them thoroughly and give some good, well thought out inputs on it. And, uh, without further ado, let's just dive into it. Forgive me guys. If I got to take a break and, and sit my allergy, so I can't breathe through my nose. So talking, you're going to hear me breathing deep. It's because I can't breathe right now while I'm speaking. It's really difficult. So forgive me if I sound a little nasally today. Now, question number one, what do I think about the conjugate method? Um, bench frequency is only two times per week due to the law of 72 popularized by Matt Wenning. Basically, it says that muscles hit need 72 hours to fully recover before training them again. This was asked by Strength Hacks Coaching. Uh, so I'm guessing he probably has a YouTube channel. So shout out, go check him out if you guys want to check him out. So he's asking my opinion on the conjugate method and bench frequency only being two times per week due to the law of 72 popularized by Matt Wenning. So there is a lot there. Um, I have seen a couple of Matt Wenning's videos, but I'm not too versed on him. So I hope this isn't taken out of context, but first let's start with the conjugate method and define what that is because i think there's a little misunderstanding and even debates around this i think when most people say what do i think about the conjugate method they're asking me what do i think about louis simmons west side conjugate method now the term conjugation is a form of periodization kind of that's really the background on it's pretty murky you hear this in a lot of different areas but the most popular popularized version of what people mean when they say conjugate method is they're usually referring to the West side conjugate method popularized by Louis Simmons, which is essentially a training system that uses a few things. The first one is the overall design of the various days in the micro cycle. You have your max effort method, which is your max effort days. You lift really heavy for a single or double or triple at like 90% plus load. Uh, you have dynamic effort days, which are kind of like your speed work days. And then you have the repetition method, which is like your bodybuilding work and doing high reps and building muscle. And then this is also uh, kind of coinciding with this idea that you need to switch out lifts very frequently. Otherwise you reach what they call accommodation, meaning you have, um, you know, sensitized the stimulus and, uh, or sensitized to the stimulus placed on your body. And now you no longer can get anything out of it because you've adapted and it's important to kind of switch the stimulus up. Now, I think in a bare bone sense, I actually like the conjugate method, contrary to what a lot of people might think. I just wouldn't program like that for myself or for my lifters. Now, uh, a lot of people on here asked, would I ever run the conjugate method? I have, I actually ran a very West side type program split back in 2012 and 13. Uh, I basically was bouncing back and forth. So I would either do West side or I would do like a bodybuilding routine and I would kind of bounce back and forth. And I really got all the way up to, I'd say about a 560 or 50 pound deadlift 
which came really quick for me. I was like two and a half, three years into training, I think I got that. And I got up to a 405-ish kind of squat doing a West Side method. Now, it's really hard to say I just did West Side or Conjugate all the way to that point because I did other programs as well. And I would even try out other random things. Like I think I tried out the Texas method for a while, but I quit because I didn't like it. And I tried a couple other little things like 531 and whatnot, but also didn't really care for those. The main one I stuck with was conjugate method and then whatever Alberto Nunez gave to me for like bodybuilding work. I would go to him a lot of the time for a customized like kind of power building program, if you will, before that even became a term. So I have had a lot of experience with it. Now, I did not run it the way that, say, Louis would probably recommend running it. And I've watched a lot of guys speak about the various ways to run uh, the conjugate method. So if you talk to some people, some people will tell you, like Mark Bell, that although there was a dynamic effort day, very rarely did any of the guys at Westside actually do a dynamic effort day. A lot of them, if they felt good, would go up to a heavy triple instead after their you know kind of warm up speed reps. And Mark Bell jokingly always says, well, every day and every week you always felt good. So you always went up to a heavy triple. So it was kind of like a max effort thing. And what, what you have to understand about the conjugate method is that it was actually a combined system of the Soviet method which was really based around switching a lot of lifts out so you don't reach accommodation kind of always changing up your stimulus combined with the bulgarian method louis simmons has, has talked about this himself he said that he basically combined these two systems i think this was a really old article you can probably still find it on on or on uh, google somewhere but he combined these two and took the idea of the bulgarians being very hyper specific to their competition style training and just doing a lot of max effort work and then paired that with this idea of switching out lifts all the time. So what you got was basically the system where people would do some kind of max effort, max out, you know, box squat with chain or something. And then they would do their dynamic effort work, you know, with something similar on their lighter day. And then they would have some bodybuilding work. And then the next week or week after that, they'd trade out the lift for something else. That way you stayed fresher, you didn't get as much repetitive overuse on your joints and you're always training something different. Now, pros and cons of the conjugate method. <clears throat> First off, um, there are a lot of pros actually. So I'm gonna start with the pros and then we'll get to the cons. I actually do believe you do need to switch up your stimulus. I just don't think it's in the ways they do it. So for me, what I change up as far as stimulus goes is more so, yes, exercise design, but every four weeks to eight weeks, not so much every other week or so. Um, a lot of the science Louis based his ideas around, in my opinion, were a little bit more uh, antiquated science. So there is actually some really old data showing lifters who frequently lift at like 90% plus they need, um, like they, they build up fatigue and mental and physical stress every three weeks or so doing that. And so his idea to work around that was to constantly switch the lifts up. I do think there's actually some pros to switching up the lifts you're doing, but I do it in a much more minimal and kind of planned out way. So what I do instead is um, I don't like comp squatting year round. A lot of you guys know that. Now I might include comp squats year round, but not heavy. Instead on my heavy day, I may do some pause squats or I may do some high bar, or, you know, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm constantly varying the rep range, the volume, the intensity and slight exercise modification. So while I'm not gonna go get a chain and do box squats and things like that, or, you know, whatever SSB, like cambered bar, you know, kind of weird squatting stuff or benching or whatever it is, um, what I'll do is switch minimal exercise design and I try to blend it into a program of uh, very linear periodization in the grand scheme of things. So we might start with in the off season doing some pause deadlifts like we're doing on our heavy day on the power program. And then the next block goes to comp deadlifts also heavy, but you know, sets of five and six, your base building strength zone, you know, your fours, fives, and sixes, and then eventually get to the max effort kind of heavier deadlifts later on in the block. So it's kind of a difference that I, there's a huge difference in how I do it. I could talk about this for hours, but while I think there's pros to switching up your exercises and your volume and intensity zones, I don't think you need to do it as often as they do. And actually the thing where I think they're lacking a con would actually be they don't they're always doing max effort work. I do think you'll get stale on that. So I think there's a problem if you constantly do 90% plus loads. I don't think that really builds strength. I think that more so is a display of strength. And I also think um, it's just kind of 
not conducive to the stresses we need to actually maximize long-term strength adaptation. It's like you either do the repetition method with a bunch of you know isolation work or you do dynamic effort, which is not that much volume and it's just really like speed work or you do really heavy stuff. There's no good quality reps done on like a comp squat or a comp bench or a comp deadlift. So that's my main problem with the conjugate method is that we're really not getting a lot of good heavy but high volume work done on the main lifts or very close variations. As you guys know on my programs, if you're following one of them, I love higher reps on squats, bench, and deadlifts. Now I like low reps too, you gotta do both, and that's why I use a DUP style split, which is kind of similar to the conjugate method where we're training multiple adaptations per week, but instead I focus more on hypertrophy days, strength days, and kind of the repetition changes, not so much the intensity changes that the conjugate method really focuses on. So that's, that's kind of like some of the pros and cons. I do think there's some other issues with it, but I actually do know a lot of people who still run Westside and get pretty good results. I think Jason Blaha is like 45 or something like that, or 40 years old, and he's still running it and actually hitting like lifetime PRs. And uh, I know other guys who are hitting it, both drug users and not drug users uh, that are doing really well with the West Side. I've, I've heard that argument that like only guys on drugs can do West Side and respond to it. That's not true. I know some natties that respond well to it. So I, I think it has its pros and cons. And I think you, if you do do it, you gotta do it a very intelligent way. Um, now, as for this next statement, this is just false. This isn't true. So bench frequency is only two times per week due to the law of 72 popularized by Matt Wenning. So there is no such rule written anywhere that your muscles um, recover in the time span of 72 hours. There is some scientific data that shows muscle recovery rates in that time span, but there's also data showing muscle recovery rates quicker than that and it really depends on the stress stimulus. So we actually, when looking at slow twitch muscle fibers, those can recover in as little as six to eight hours uh, and as maximum as 24 hours later. Not that we're training slow twitch muscle fibers, but the, the point being is the way they stimulated those was through cardiovascular intensive exercise and really high endurance repetition methods. And, um, and, and then likewise, we have a lot of data where you know people recover in 48 hours their muscular soreness goes away after 48 hours we have some data showing 72 it changes on on what body parts you're looking at what kind of uh group is in the exercise program that you're you're um designing the experiments around meaning like their training age and their technical prowess and whatnot so I guess what I'm saying is I think some people have extrapolated from the body of scientific literature on muscle recovery that there is some hard set rules that your muscles just every 72 hours, that's when they're recovered and you're good to go. That's not how the body works. And it's also a very reductionist viewpoint on training in general. You do not need to be fully recovered to train hard again. I don't know where this idea has come from. I do a lot of my sessions under recovered, but I tweak those sessions in order to alter around that and maybe train multiple functions or different things we're going for. So what I mean by that is I actually bench um, 48 hours after my heaviest, hardest bench day. So for instance, on Saturdays, I go in and I do a squat, a bench, and a deadlift workout that's really intensive, really hard, to the point where I actually have trouble sleeping on most Saturdays because my CNS is so damn stimulated, and we're in the gym for like three hours. It's really hardcore volume intensive, and the bench work is insane. It's like top sets of fives and fours, and now on this new block, I got some bench block work after that, and then I got back down sets after that. I'm accumulating like six to seven hard sets on bench press, and then 48 hours later on Monday, I'm waking up early and uh, I'm going into the gym and hitting some pretty hard sets of Larson press, um, which, excuse me, is an even fuller range of motion, so I'm using my upper body muscles even more isolated uh, in the pressing muscles than I would say on a competition style bench press and I'm fine and I'm hitting PRs on Larson press. So this idea that you need to be fully recovered for training is a really reductionist mindset. It's it's just like uh, plug and play. Like I, I really hate, I think, when people try to look at scientific data and they, they 
they say, okay, what are all the, the hard definitive answers for everything with training? So what I mean by that is, okay, how many meals per day should I eat? How, how many times per week should I train the bench press? And they try to come up with these answers to that when, when the answer is always, it depends. There's so many different situations, different ways to design a program. There's so much nuance to it that like there are no hard rules. You can train. I know people who bench three days in a row. I have athletes who are doing it right now. Their arms aren't falling off and their chest isn't exploding. They're recovering and they're hitting PRs. And uh, I would argue a lot of my guys are probably benching or gaining bench strength, I should say, than um, a lot of other trainees. I've sent guys to Bench Worlds. I had a lifter from France represent Prime at Bench Worlds, at IPF Worlds. Um, he was uh, benching, I think at that time, I get so mixed up on the kilos, uh, 66 kilo class, but I'm trying to remember what he was benching in pounds. I think it was about 379 pounds. So, you know, these small guy, this small guy was lifting, you know, damn near 400 pounds on the bench press. And we had him benching five times per week. Now, again, reductionist statement. How was he able to bench five times a week? Well, he has a really big arch and a really, uh, he used max grip with on the bench press. So obviously his recovery stimulus or his strengths or his, excuse me, his stress stimulus to his recovery ratio is gonna be a lot smaller than say someone like myself who has a greater range of motion. But even me, I can train every 48 hours or so on bench and be totally fine. I've even had programs in the past where I benched two days in a row and I was fine on the second day. I definitely wasn't the most fresh, but I still got a good workout in. And there's different ways to align this and ensure you still recover in the grander scheme of things. So looking at things in such a simplistic way where you're like, okay, how many times per week? Well, how about how do we progress from week to week? Why, why are we only thinking about day to day? Let's think about the week to week progressions because that's arguably more important than how recovered you are on any given day. What happens eight weeks from now is more important than what happens in three days from now on my bench press workout. So you guys got to get out of these mindsets and think a little deeper, I think, about this. Not, not you in, in particular, but he's stating what someone else has said. And I, I really want to get rid of these like lacking any kind of nuanced mindsets that some people on YouTube tend to have. Now, um, moving on to the next question, I think we spent quite a bit of time there. I'm gonna put that copy down because my heart's already gone. Um, why do you say hook grip is unreliable? And then I think we had another one on hook grip, which we'll get to later. Um, oh yeah, someone else asked, uh, Adam, God, I can't say your last name, Y-E-O-H-U, yo? Uh, he asked, when is reverse grip better than hook grip in the deadlift and vice versa? And if these factors change between sumo and conventional, and then someone else asked, why did you say hook grip is unreliable? I feel like these questions are kind of combined. So first off, I usually think mixed grip is better than hook grip in the deadlift. In most cases, not all cases, I do have some hook grip pullers under me. One of my strongest clients, Leon, he's a conventional puller who pulls with hook grip, which is pretty rare, especially at the level of weight he's pulling. He pulls 750 pounds. So he's a strong hook grip puller who I allow to pull hook grip. Um, but there are more people than not that I think do better with a mixed grip. Now, usually speaking, if I want someone to use hook grip, what I'm looking at is more so what's happening in the shoulders and back than anything else. So I do not believe, so, so they asked why is hook grip unreliable? Because it just is. It, it, it adds so many factors besides now just your grip strength. And don't, don't get it twisted. Hook grip requires grip strength. I don't know where this idea that hook grip is just this magical talon that your hands just lock onto the bar and they're never gonna have a grip problem again. That's not how the human body works. You still have to grip the bar. It's just, it helps you kind of achieve the same thing a mixed grip does with both your hands in the pronated position. And so uh, hook grip is unreliable because you're adding in these factors of torn calluses come a lot easier on hook grip. You're adding in the factor of the sensitivity of your thumbs playing a factor in like, you know, how well you can hook grip. Oftentimes people who hook grip, they can't do high reps with hook grip. So they have to use straps and training, which in my opinion is a problem because if you're using straps and training, you're constantly changing your setup and things like that. So there's all these factors with hook grip that just make it so unreliable. And I've just seen more people miss on grip with a hook grip than I have seen people miss on grip with a, a mixed grip. Now there are some circumstances where people do better with hook grip. Kaylor Wollum, perfect example. 
Um, I think, didn't Jamal switch too? I think Jamal also switched, and he's pulling some heavy loads. Uh, Garrett Fear. So some of the best deadlifters in the world will use hook grip. It's not to say hook grip is not good. Like I said, my client Leon doesn't want to make that clear. However, what I have found to stem from people watching them is I notice a lot of guys just come to me fresh into powerlifting. They're like, oh, I'm using hook grip. And I'm like, okay, interesting. Well, okay, let's keep going with it. And then all of a sudden they have all these problems with their hook grip and training. I'm like, okay, wait, why are you using hook grip in the first place? And they're like, well, I don't know. I just saw everyone else doing it. I'm like, have you tried a mixed grip? That was what we did with my client, Daniel. So if you saw my video about how we added, I think it was titled how we added 225 pounds slash a hundred and whatever kilos of 10 kilos 105 kilos whatever the math is to daniel's total i have a video titled something along those lines someone correct my math for me in the comment section but the, in that video we talk about how we switch daniel from hook grip to a mixed grip and his deadlift blew up and he recited in a text message in that video that he felt the switch from hook grip to mixed grip allowed him to have more consistency in his slack pole. And I think that is huge. If you can have more consistency in your slack pole, your setup, your overall execution of a lift on any given day, and you don't have grip problems from it, lo and behold, you're gonna be better. Now, you can always switch back to hook grip later by you know staying mixed grip now, but it's very hard to do the other way around. If you spend year after year after year doing hook grip, mixed grip will end up feeling very awkward to you in the long run, and I've had the hardest time switching people away from it. So I usually speaking like to save hook grip for like just that emergency. Okay, now this person all of a sudden is having grip problems, maybe we can experiment to see if hook grip fixes it. What you have to understand is there's no hard set rules. I'm not opposed to trying hook grip, but I'm also not opposed to just doing, or I'm also not on board with just doing hook grip sporadically just because your famous YouTuber does it and you wanna mimic what they're doing. So you have to have some thought process behind it. And I've just found it in training for most people to be unreliable on the platform. It slips, the bar affects it. They always have an excuse as to why the callus ripped or whatever it is. Oh, the bar was bent or oh this or that. There's always something with my mixed grip guys that just don't deal with that problem as much. Now, um, back to the other top question. Um, where was it at here? Let me find it. Oh yeah, why is reverse grip better uh, than hook grip in the deadlift and vice versa? And if these factors change between sumo and conventional? So um, I kind of got some of the main points there. So, so hook grip and reverse grip or mixed grip really is uh, the proper term. Both have their pros and cons. You gotta weigh them out. Now I will say sumo deadlifters tend to do better more often with hook grip than conventional polars. So there, I think there's more reason to go hook grip on a sumo than there is a conventional. The reason why is back to what I was saying earlier is I look to see what more about what's going on at the shoulders and back in a hook grip to see if there's anything I wanna change uh, more than anything else. So I don't even pay attention to the grip strength that much. That to me that you can fix someone's grip strength issues. When it comes to hook grip, what I look for is, is there symmetry in their sumo deadlift or are they windmilling? So if they're pulling their sumo deadlift in mid grind, they're twisting to their side and one shoulder slumped forward and the other one's pulled back, I'm definitely gonna look at hook grip as an option because symmetry is so important in a sumo deadlift. But likewise, uh, in conventional pullers sometimes, sometimes it gets some back and hip issues where um, I will admit, I think from my mixed grip, I do actually believe I have an imbalance in my back. My right QL and my right back and side, like QL oblique, that whole sling is just always tight, always worked, and that's my upper um, or my, my uh, supinated grip. So I actually supinate my right hand, which is kind of weird for right hand dominant people, but that's just something I did early on. I just did it like that. It's always been the case. But anyway, my whole right side is bigger visually, and it's not a muscle belly attachment thing. I mean, my right back is a little bit more dense than my left. Now, if you had never heard me say that, you probably couldn't see this. So I don't want people to panic or mix grip polars and think, oh my God, I'm gonna look like a mutant and I'm gonna look all deformed because you know one side of my back's bigger than the other. D don't think, no one's gonna notice that. I only notice this because of some of the pains I get but it's, it's completely manageable and keep in mind I'm deadlifting in the you know low to mid 700s and I've been deadlifting now for about 10 years. And, it's, and when I say it's pain, it's really not pain. It's like stiffness, it's just little things I deal with. Now, if someone deals with that stuff at a higher, more advanced rate, if they're getting a lot of pain reception 
and I, I believe it's from symmetry in the deadlift, then I'm definitely not opposed to trying the hook grip out. But again, there has to be a reason uh, to do it in the first place. And, and honestly, I would say in my career of coaching, I've probably only changed people to hook grip like three to four times and maybe a little bit more than that, maybe like four to five. And I would say one to two of the two of those definitely have switched back. So my client Luis just recently switched back to a mixed grip because guess what? Hook grip was super unreliable for him. We did it for symmetry reasons, but his grip strength would just kept giving him problems. So we've gone back to mixed grip. It's fixed the issue. And lo and behold, actually symmetry is not a problem anymore. Now we're going to keep a close eye on it and we might have to, you know, switch again or something or look at some other factors. But generally speaking, that's kind of where we're at. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. This one got a lot of thumbs up. Why do you not have an Instagram? <laughs> or at least why doesn't Prime Strength have one? So a lot of reasons for this. Um, I just don't like social media. It's really tribal and it's just not my my cup of tea. Um, I honestly wouldn't even be on YouTube if there was some other way for me to somehow magically convey information to the people of the world. But um, YouTube is the lesser of all the evils because you have the most independence on here. I found Instagram made me really bad as a coach, uh, really made me bad as a business. I, I was really lacking in some very like fundamental business aspects because I was so concerned with being this like coach on Instagram and stuff. And um, I just realized it wasn't a place for me. The identity on there, the things on there that can spur from Instagram, I think are pretty unhealthy. So I try to avoid that. A lot of people have asked me to start an Instagram with prime strength. I honestly don't think I'm gonna do it. We might, I don't know. I'm just not a fan of Instagram in general either. It's the most, like it's it's borderline a TikTok now where it's just like scroll and scroll and scroll and stare at this for two seconds like a zombie and keep scrolling. I think that's so unhealthy for people. And um, I also hate the fact that on Instagram, you're limited to such extreme short form content. It lacks any kind of depth. And I think it's everything wrong with human beings right now, if I had to be honest. And so everything in fitness and in life in general, I find is just worse in short form content. I'm a person of nuance. I'm definitely not a person of, of small talk. So for me to try to cram what I have up in here onto Instagram just doesn't work. And, um, yeah, just not a fan. I don't think I'll come back to it, but I don't know. I don't want to ever say no forever. Um, next question. I'm going to try to start banging through these quicker, guys. I realize I'm, I'm going a little slow here. How do you... Uh, I'm sorry, I should be saying who's asking these. I keep forgetting. So, Daddy G, D-A-E-D-Y-G. God, you guys are going to laugh at me trying to pronounce these. Daddy G, I don't know if that's a play on like Daddy G, but how do you deal with the client that comes to you when they're dealing with injuries? How does this affect the way you program for them? How do you work around it? And what do you do to help them heal? How do you, how do the goals change? Great question. So first thing I do when I have a client that comes to me with injuries, we figure out what is causing pain. So uh, what's provoking pain reception? Now, is it a squat? Okay, when, when they squat, what part of the range of motion or what intensity of load or what amount of volume seems to spur the pain? Okay, so it's when you go really heavy and hit full depth in a squat. Okay, well, let's mitigate range of motion and or mitigate temp tempo to try to work around this. Like th that's kind of the general really quick and dirty way of putting it of what I do is I basically look at the very pragmatic application of what they're doing and what's causing pain and I try to work around that. I don't like to think of things as injuries anymore. I just like to think of things as pain reception. So the idea of injuries implies that there is damaged tissue and you must wait for that damaged tissue to heal and that is when you will be pain free and this is not accurate in a lot of scenarios. There are some scenarios where that's accurate in when you twist an ankle. Oftentimes you're going to need to wait for that to heal to do anything on it. However, any of you guys who have twisted or broken ankle, like myself, I've done this, you will know that pain can linger even well after the tissues have completely he healed. And then the, the doctors and physical therapists out there start making up these other narratives that are not founded by science. They say things like, oh, now there's scar tissue that you have to break down the scar tissue and that's how you get it to heal. Or now there's this or that. And, and they have these goofy narratives. Really at the end of the day, if you dive into the, the scientific literature on pain science, one, you'll realize how stupid you are because it's so complex. It really is, and it's really out of my scope, to be honest. 
But two, you'll understand that the leading researchers who do study this stuff and how to fix it, which is very different than the people studying pain science. Now, let me be clear. Actual pain science is the study of neurological and physiological mechanisms and the things that actually contribute, cause pain. Like that's an intricate look at the body's idea of, of pain reception. Um, now, there's other researchers out there who study actual like ways to fix and heal pain. So Jill Cook is a great researcher who's done a ton on tendinopathy. And she's the first person I ever went to that uh, really gave me an answer for how to fix my quad tendinopathy that lasted for two years. And her pragmatic application of, of what to do worked so well because she was testing this on people and in person and figuring out ways to get around this. And so um, she came up with some really clever things that I'll, I can talk about later. But essentially what I'm saying is that you basically have this idea with injury that pain is always a X plus Y equals Z kind of scenario. So this is injured. Once this heals, you will no longer feel pain. That's not the way it works. Pain science, when you dive into it, it's very complicated. And there's really two realms of pain science. There's the pain, the study of the actual pain science. And then there's the researchers trying to heal people, figure out modalities and programs and things of the such, you know, exercise paradigms to really fix someone's long-term chronic pain. And when you dive into this, you'll realize that the answer as to how to fix pain is really simplistic, but the understandings of pain is really complex. Like so, so, so complex where I gave up trying to read the literature, to be honest, and even just listening to some of the, the researchers out there, you'd be shocked how, how deep of a rabbit hole you can dive into that stuff. But anyway, so what do I do when the athlete first comes to me? We examine what kind of ranges of motion, what kind of volume, what kind of intensity, whatever it is that, that aggravates them. And I figure out, okay, how do we design a program where they keep moving as much as humanly possible without aggravating the pain further? We use a pain scale to test this, which I stole directly from Jill Cook. You can go check out her research. The, what I did every day when I had uh, quad tendinopathy is I rated my pain uh, through this provocation test. I basically provoked pain through like putting my, my knees into a very uh, provoking position that caused an incited pain at the quad tendon. And I would judge what that pain was on a scale of one to 10. And based on that, I would actually literally decide if I was going to squat that day and how much I was going to squat, things like that. And so I kind of do this with my athletes in a very pragmatic like simplistic way and i tell my athletes all the time i actually had this my buddy nick who you guys will see in the videos he's doing the meet with us here in february and he sent me a joking voice memo because i sent him one of my prs and i coach him so normally he sends me videos and he responded back as if he was coaching me and he started using all these terms that i use and he goes yeah man this looks good but just make sure you understand that your work capacity is going to dictate how much your tissue resiliency is at and you got to be careful to not overwork your tissues and he starts saying all this lingo i say but the reason why is because when he came to me he was injured and so every day i was hitting him with this this lingo where i was trying to explain to him the way pain kind of works and what you have to do from a programming standpoint so that's kind of the easiest way of putting it is i try to teach my clients what pain is about and how to get around it so they can understand it and then make fun of me when I send them a video. And we try to make sure the program is really basically as hardcore as possible without inciting more pain, which sounds really obvious, but that's, that's literally what we do and it works. It actually works, but you just have to methodically think this stuff through. Now, how do goals change? I definitely make goals like short-term and long-term. So the long-term goal is still the same, get them stronger, get them bigger. But how do we get there? Well, we're gonna have to hit maybe three goals on the way to that goal. So short-term goal is get moving pain-free. Long, uh, Mid-term goal is to get back to your old strength levels. And then short-term goal after that is maybe surpass those old strength levels while still also staying pain-free. And then long-term would be the big PRs we're looking for. So that's pretty much it. Um, another question on the conjugate method. What do you think of the conjugate method? Have you ever done it? And if not, would you already answered that? You guys really think that. So this is a fun one. What are your thoughts on Greg Doucette's opinion on RPE? I did not know what Greg Doucette's opinion on RPE was, although I love Greg Doucette. So we're going to watch this video. I'm just going to play this. Let's turn. Push yourself hard, be loaded, be careful, and oh my goodness. Hold on. I got this video pulled up from him. Push yourself hard. Periodization and overload and yeah, let's throw a bunch of big words, hypertrophy. And yeah, go to the freaking gym and 
train hard. <laughs> Dude, he just always sounds like Gilbert Godfrey to me. Um, Dragon, today I'm reviewing a video by Jeff Cavalier. It's titled Six Reasons You're Not Building Muscle. Uh, oh I'm my god. Okay, so I did not actually watch this video, but I've I've gotten the gist that Greg Doucette thinks RP is kind of a joke, as does, I think, Athlean X. So you guys already know my opinion on, on RPE, but let me give you my opinion on Greg Doucette. So Greg, I think, is actually awesome. So a lot of you may find it really mind-blowingly shocking to, to hear that I rant like Greg when I'm not on camera. The reason why is because although I'm someone who likes to practice under the guise or under the um, blankets, I guess you could say, of science. Although I really care about reading research, although I care about very hard empirical evidence to lead my ways, I also really believe in anecdote and I really believe in pragmatics. You'll notice I use the word pragmatic all the time. My girlfriend always makes fun of me for that. But human beings are practical before they are anything else. And what I mean by that is I think so many people get caught up in the small details that it drives me insane when someone views, you know, say Jeff Nipper, not that Jeff Nipper's YouTube channel is bad, it's not, it's great, but they'll watch a Jeff Nipper YouTube video here and there, they'll watch an Athlean X video, they'll watch all these people, and all of a sudden they think they're this giant expert on fitness just because they're parroting and mimicking what other people are saying. First of all, you don't even have close to the depth of that person that you're mimicking's understandings on the topics they're talking about. The reason I know this is people try to mimic what I say and they'll just get my point completely misconstrued and not actually even fully grasp the concepts of what we're talking about. They can't even conceptualize the idea. So I think there's this air in the fitness industry right now where people like are just either way too sciencey and like, oh my God, bro, give me the, the answer based on the systematic review and they get off to like reading research. And then there's like the bros who just like refuse to use any evidence at all. Now I'm someone where if you show me a group of people who are doing something really well, I don't give a crap what research says. If this coach over here has all of his guys squatting big ass weights, but this coach over here has got all the systematic reviews and scientific papers in his hand and he's yelling at his clients on what to do, but those guys aren't squatting big weights, who do you think I'm gonna hang out with? I'm gonna go kick it with the guy squatting big weights. That's just how my mind works. If I'm watching that shit happen in real time, I don't care what that research says over here. I will always choose anecdotes that is good anecdote over scientific evidence any day of the week. And I think that shocks people when they hear that. And I also do think people train like wussies these days. Now to me, the RPE scale is, is really simple. Um, I think from what I was taking in that video, and I literally only watched that portion of the video, I haven't seen any other parts of it, but I can already tell that Greg's probably gonna rant that most people worry about every little detail of like, oh my God, I gotta go RP seven today and I gotta keep a few reps in the tank and they have not learned to push themselves in the gym. And I actually completely fucking agree with that. So I, it's funny because to me, the RP system is really just a system to essentially accommodate for over fatigue and excuse me, I'm burping here, over fatigue and ensuring fitness is progressing at a very quick rate, but that is not an excuse to train soft. And I think most people who don't know what they're doing when they apply an RP system, they just like throw these random RPs out, or even if they've just mimicked someone else or come up with their ideas on it, they're, they're thinking too much about the details and they really should just be having a coach do this for them their first few years. And they should just be doing whatever the program says and training really hard. Now to me, RP eight or nine is quite a hard set. Uh, keep in mind, if, if you're truly doing a squat to RP eight or nine, that is a crazy set. That means if you did one more rep and then some, this weight that's on your back is going to staple you down to the safety pins or worse if you don't have them staple you down to the ground. Like that's a pretty intense fucking set for your whole neurology to just give out mid repetition and then you have to put something down. Now I think most people who rate their RPEs heavily underrate them. It's funny because people always accuse me of this, but I'm just very explosive and I'm highly technical in my lifts. So my lifts look way faster on camera than they actually are. But a true RPE eight or nine is a pretty hard damn set. And I think Greg would actually agree with this 
if we got into the semantics of like what RP even eight even looks like on curls. I see guys all the time coming back to John, who's on on this list somewhere. My old client John, who we talked about in previous podcasts, uh, this kid was doing thirty sets on arms when he came to me. Uh, and was like, bro, you don't program enough arms when he saw the first program. Lo and behold, he sent me a text the other day, man, you're right on arms. My arms are bigger than ever. And he sent me a picture of his arms. They're growing like crazy because we're doing a bunch of heavy pressing and I'm pushing him like crazy on the eight to 12 sets of arms that he has per week. I sent, I made him send me videos of his curls and I realized he was not curling anywhere near the RP that he was supposed to. His idea of RP8 was more like RP5. And this is what I found to be true for most people. So my response back to Greg would be, I do agree most people think way too much about their training and just need to go train fucking hard and learn how to do that first. But I also would say that if you're a good coach, and that's the thing is I think you need a coach to help you with this, you will teach your clients how to train hard while uh, simultaneously using an RP system. And again, you'll be on their ass like, hey, that doesn't look like RP eight or nine. I know that's not. And every time, lo and behold, when I train with people in person or I'm coaching them, this is what happens. We have them go truly to RP 10 on those arm sets when it's like that week three on my program and they got that deload coming next week. I push them like absolute crazy. And they tell me all the time, like, holy shit, that's one of the hardest workouts I've ever had. I'm like, yep. And dude, I, I'm telling you, I might as well just get all these guys on camera. I got my boy, Nick, who's doing this meet with us. He's been my best friend for years, but he's never trusted me to do his programming because it's hard to do when both of us have been in the game as long as each other. It's just, he went a different route in fitness. He finally let me take control of his programming. Same thing, he's sending me pictures of his watch, of how many calories he's burning in his workouts. Now it's literally doubled compared to before. He's showing me how big he's getting and strong he's getting in such a short period of time. Same thing with our client, John, all these people. And it's when they come to me, they realize one of the first things I teach them is how to train hard, but also train smart. And I think that's my main point here is the RP system is amazing, but it's not an excuse to train weak. And that's the thing is most people think it is, and that's why they approach it incorrectly. Um, moving on, how to program lifts based on significant caloric deficit and surplus. So this is really easy. Uh, don't change that much other than your volume. So. I actually, the only difference I make when I'm training someone in a caloric deficit is I'm going to, even if it's significant, is I'm going to give them a lot of repetition volume to help um, actually produce more of a caloric deficit and focus on some short-term muscle gains. So usually when someone comes to me with the idea of losing weight, they usually want to lose, you know, maybe 10 pounds or so. If it's a big weight loss journey, this is going to be completely different. But if this is kind of like, I want to clean up, look good for the beach, and I want to lose this weight fast, there is no law that says you cannot build muscle and lose fat at the same time. I hate when people pretend like those two things are exclusively mutual. Um, they, they're not they, you, you, mutually exclusive. I said that backwards. Wow. Tongue twister. They are not mutually exclusive. You have to really understand the more nuance again, coming back to nuance, ideas of what's going on physiologically in the body when you're essentially stimulating muscle protein synthesis and muscle nuclei and satellite cells and things of this nature in order to build muscle. And to do this correctly, it does not necessarily require a caloric surplus, at least in the, the short term. And so actually, usually what I do when my clients are like, okay, I wanna cut down, look a little good for the beach, and I wanna do this fast and get it done with, so we put them in a large caloric deficit. One of the things I help to kind of actually get the caloric deficit up is I give them a lot of repetition. So I, contrary to what a lot of coaches will recommend, I have them go do volume and really high reps, sets of 10, 12, 15s or more. And there's still some heavy stuff in the program, don't get me wrong, but the majority of it, 75% of the program is aimed around higher repetitions. I'm getting them to burn more calories because yes, contrary to what people seem to believe, doing high reps on squats does burn a lot more calories than doing sets of three. I don't know why people seem to think that's not a thing. Go do a set of 10 on squats and tell me what it feels like. <laughs> so I have them go do a lot of reps. And then usually by the time we're done with the first phase of training, a four to six week block, we're almost all the way done with the cut. So in this case, now all I got to do is take them through a strength phase and a peaking phase, see where their strength is at at the end of this cut, and then build them back the next training cycle, like in the new body weight range. And so I kind of, I guess what I'm saying is, 
I approach the caloric deficit with the phases of training aligning from early off season, meaning where we're focusing on a hypertrophy and a lot of repetitions. And then I take them through a full cycle. And essentially I look at that cycle as like, hey, we're probably not gonna gain that much strength right now, if any at all. And we're just looking to maintain. And hopefully we might even build a little muscle here early on because the first few weeks of the deficit, you can still build a ton of muscle. And then on top of that, you kind of get into a recomp where you're losing fat and building muscle at the same time. Now, eventually, if they keep that caloric deficit going, they're not gonna be able to do that. They won't be able to continuously build muscle. And eventually they can even lose muscle if they keep going with it. But a short kind of quick cut, you can definitely build muscle during this time. And that's usually what happens. And then from there, I do another training cycle where we put them back into a caloric surplus or very like easy maintenance. And we just get them trying to gaining, trying to get gaining again in the strength zone. But we, we just kind of start a new cycle over and essentially um, repeat everything we just did, but now in a caloric maintenance or surplus to get their strength acclimated and back up to where it was at the newfound body weight. So that's essentially what I kind of do. As for a caloric surplus, whether it's big or small, I don't really change a thing. Like, I think there's this idea that like, it's funny, a lot of people say don't change the repetition range when you go through, you know, like a cut or something like that. That's actually the only thing I change. But likewise, those same people, when they do cuts, they're like, okay, I'm not gonna squat heavy or very frequently because I'm cutting, so now I'm losing strength and muscle, so I'm just gonna stop, you know, squatting very frequently or hard. Or It's almost like they shut off. They're like, okay, I can't make gains now, so let me just, you know, do some bodybuilding or I don't know, whatever it is they do. And they kind of like put their mind in this reductionist phase where they're like, no, 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 I can't do anything. I got to pull everything back. And in, in reality, it's kind of the opposite. It's like train as hard as you possibly can to push adaptation. And more than likely, you'll be able to maintain, if not gain a little strength, and you'll also be able to build some muscle. So that's kind of my thought on it. Um, next question from Dwayne Johnson, um, different Dwayne than The Rock, although shout out The Rock, I know he's watching too. I've watched a lot of your programming videos. Are they good for older lifters, 40 plus, or how can they be modified for us old guys? Yes, plenty good. You are not necessarily, unless you're dealing with testosterone issues and a few other things, any less resilient than say a 20 year old to injuries by anything substantial. I've trained a ton of 40 year olds who have gotten stronger doing the same things I've trained my 20 year olds with. There might be very small differences, but more or less, the only advice I'd give you is just be smart. If something's kind of feeling fucked up, you know, switch it out, right? Like you drop down the reps or up the, or drop down the load or, or change the exercise paradigm or whatever you need to do in order to stay a little bit more injury free. But for the most part, like you can do what the younger guys do, you just gotta build up to that level. And that's what I usually find with older people is most people who start strength training at 40 years old have been sedentary their whole life. And in this case, you're so used to nothing that a little bit goes a long way. But this is just as true for the 20 year old who starts strength training. The only difference is, is usually 20 year olds are a little bit more active. So for them, the acclimation phase is a little bit quicker and easier. You just gotta make sure you get up to the working level. So start slow, build your tolerance of tissue, your work capacity, all those good things, your joint resili your resiliency up. And once you get there, you'll be good to go and you can do what everyone else does. Um, eventually, I say when you hit about maybe 50, 55, that's when you gotta be a little bit more cautious. But up even at 40, I know a ton of world record holders at 40. Uh, Marissa Inda, um, God, um, I'm blanking on his name. What is the guy? Uh, Dave Ricks. I don't know why I couldn't think of his name for a second. Fucking six years old hitting lifetime PRs. Natural lifters. You know what I mean? So you'll be good. Uh, Owen Lutz, let's not sure how to pronounce it. L-U-T-E-S. Do you do any comp movements in the off season? No, I do not. Yes, man. Of course I do. Come on. You watch, you watch my videos. Come on, man. Insert Joe Biden voice. Um, <laughs> yeah, dude, I, that's weird that, uh, someone would ask me that maybe you're a new subscriber. I don't know. Um, do I do comp movements in the off season? Most definitely. Um, I do comp squat at least once a week in the off season, comp bench at least once, usually twice in the off season, but sometimes that'll change. And then um, deadlifts, deadlifts is the one I'm not afraid to go away from on comp specificity, but not necessarily because you can't, just because I kind of have fun doing pause deadlifts and other things. So, um, but I definitely do comp lifts in the off season. Um, you just watch any of my videos and you'll see it. Okay, next question. Adam Yo, I think asked another one. Uh, cheater asking two questions. 
as a powerlifting trainee who's had significant training experience in the gym but took significant time off, for example, six months, would you recommend following a protocol to get them back up to speed or should they just hop onto linear progression and ride that out until a plateau? Much appreciated. No, definitely with any significant time off from training, especially when it's like six months or so, you need to reintroduce your tissues and your body, your nervous system, everything to stimulus again. So you should not get on a linear program necessarily. I do think you can like kind of focus on linear progression, so to say, but don't just get on your typical run of the mill program. In fact, your first week, you should probably be lifting so much lighter than you think. This is the most important thing you can do to avoid injury. Your body will adapt very quickly and you'd be shocked what light stimulus can do for strength gains, even just for one week. And it's way better to do that than overwork your tissues really early and come back. The last thing you want to do is plateau again because of an injury after a layoff. So come back really slow. Mike Zerdos, Dr. Zerdos, um, he has an amazing breakdown and video on what to do, like basically post-COVID shutdown. He did this for the first shutdown. Now we're entering another shutdown. Shout out government. Yay, we love you. Um, being very sarcastic there. So we're, we, we're doing another shutdown and I think a lot of people are going to need advice on this. And so what I want you to do is, is go watch his video and actually listen to the video because he explains the theory of, of myonuclei and how your tissues kind of respond to atrophy and whatnot. He, res, he explains what the scientific literature shows and then he also gives some very smart programming tips. And I believe there's even a free program, but don't quote me on that, on basically what to do when you're coming back. So I'd highly recommend going to check that out. Um, next question, Jared Miller, do you need to lift with a belt? And if so, when should you start using one? What benefits specifically does it provide? So I think if <laughs> the fucking YouTuber answer with this would be like, no, man, you don't need to wear a belt unless you want to wear. Everyone wears a belt who's strong or big. So like, yeah, you need to wear a belt. When should you start using one right away? The quicker you can learn to use a belt to your advantage, the better. There's no like, you're not going to like detrain your spinal, you know, stability muscles or anything by using a belt there. And I'm not laughing at you who asked this question. I want to be very clear. I'm, I'm laughing at the YouTubers who say really goofy things out there that make people think using a belt is some giant crutch. I would argue most people who've used a belt their entire training career, but like never really didn't use one, probably brace better and have actual more spinal control than say, uh, and just core control in general, than say someone who like never uses a belt. Most people who don't train with a belt squat with a lot of overextension. So I think in my opinion, you should get a belt, use one right away and learn to use it very well, either from a coach or religiously watching videos on it. Uh, next question, Adam, how many questions are you going to answer, bro? I'm just kidding. Uh, answer, ask, is there such a thing as it being too early to get a coach for powerlifting? No, I, I do. I am kidding. I want to be clear about that. I'm just giving you shit, man. Uh, I love the fact that you ask so many questions because it shows me you're eager to learn. Uh, is there such a thing as it being too early to get a coach for powerlifting? Because beginners gain really easy and maybe it's not as necessary if they're not trying to compete anytime soon. If so, at what point is a good time? Um, so no, it's never too early to get a coach for powerlifting. I think the best time to get a coach is before you've built a foundation. So it's kind of like that old adage that, you know, um, hard habits die hard. You know, it's, if you build up habits and technical prowess in a way, not technical prowess, but, um, your technique in a way that is inefficient and poor over long periods of time, a coach is going to have a way harder time fixing that than if you're a blank slate. So come to the coach early before you've built up the bad habits, before you've trained and destroyed your tissues because you ran small off junior three times in a row. I'm laughing because I did that. Um, you know, go to the coach and get some guidance. And, and, and dude, I would, I wish we had coaches the way you guys have coaches today. I knew from literally month one, I should get a coach before online coaching was really a thing. It was literally just 3DMJ doing it. And I don't mean this as a knock on 3DMJ. Their level of coaching back then is nothing compared to what they offer now because they had no clue what they're doing. No one was doing that. There were some of the first online coaches to ever hit the scene. 
And um, back then, like our idea of coaching was talk to Birdo every few months and just get a program from him. Again, this is not a knock on him. Just we didn't know how to coach back then remotely. It was just such a new novel thing that no one really thought of. It, you know, props to those guys for even taking the leap. I mean, I'm sure there was someone else who was coaching online before them, but they were the first people I ever saw doing it. And they were the only people I could find online. And they happened to just live in the Bay Area. The majority of them at that time, Eric Helms. Uh, Brad Loomis was in Reno, but Eric Helms and Alberto Nunez were both in the Bay, in Elk Grove, and in Hayward. Hayward was literally two cities away from me. And so I got Berto as a coach. I got to train with these guys here and there. And um, man, though, if I would have had access to coaching like you guys do now, I would have killed for that. And I would have paid any kind of price because coaching is so invaluable. And I think you should do it, honestly, right away. Um, <clears throat> How to find, okay, Luke Muller, Mueller, I think Muller. Uh, how to find a deal torso angle for the squat. So your torso angle in the squat will always be essentially defined. Okay, so similar to hip height in the deadlift, you guys saw my video on that. It's gonna be defined by your anthropometry and your overall technique falling into the baseline of what is required for a maximally efficient squat. So what I mean by that is depending on how you load your knees, where your bar is placed over midfoot or not placed over midfoot, and how you open your hips is all gonna essentially define your torso angle. So you can only load your knees so far forward and you can only open your hips so far outward through external rotation before you get kind of negative effects. So you don't wanna squat with your knees as far open as you can, like a sumo, that makes no sense. And likewise, not necessarily everyone's going to load their knees as far forward into a squat as they possibly can. Um, you're going to limit yourself on depth a little, so you're not going to keep moving the knees forward even when you're past depth. And you're only going to open up so much. And the bar has to maintain over midfoot position. And then you also have to centrate your uh, torso, uh, meaning, or your core, I should say, rather. So ensuring your core is not either flexed over or overextended. All of these things will... Uh, affect one another. So if you overextend, well, your bar position can be a lot more vertical over your midfoot because you're arching your back into extension and keeping your torso more upright. But if you get rid of that overextension, you're going to be slightly more declined with your bar position and your overall torso angle. However, that's going to be a smarter position to be in. Likewise, if you open your hips too much or too little, that will affect the angle of your torso. The more open your hips are, the more vertical your torso is going to get. The more you load into the quads, the more vertical your torso is going to get. So these few things are going to kind of dictate where that falls. What you want to look for instead is how are you opening your hips? How are you loading your knees? How are you bracing your, your to torso and your core? And where is the bar over midfoot? If all of those things are in check, wherever your torso angle is at, that is the torso angle you should be squatting with because the rest of it will be defined by your anthropometry, the length of your limbs, the length of your torso, the length of your arms, all these diff, well, arms not really in a squat, but you get what I'm saying. Your anthropometry mixed with those factors of your, your tissues and how you orient them in space in the squat in a maximally efficient way will always dictate it first. So what we need is bar over midfoot, hips open enough but not to the point where the knees are not stacked over the feet and knees loaded forward enough to where we hit depth but not too much where you're sinking the damn squat down to fucking well i mean i guess if you really want to sink a squat at my last meet apparently i needed to sink it that deep because that ref was just being so strict so maybe you do want to load your knees that far forward but anyway my point being is once you've done all these things then that will define your torso angle you shouldn't really think of your torso angle that is more so a byproduct of the rest of your lift going correctly. I hope that makes conceptual sense. Sometimes answering these on the fly is a little difficult for me to find the language to properly convey what I'm trying to um, say. Uh, next question from Mark. Is it really good to squat frequently? So what is squat frequency or frequency of a lift of any kind doing? Let's look at what it's doing first and then we can de determine if it's good to squat frequently and we have to put a definition what is how do we define frequently? Is that two times per week, five times per week, three times? Where What is considered frequently to you? So let's take a look at a, a few things here. First off, what's a um, positive or a pro of squatting frequently? Volume distribution. So let's say you want to, you, let's say your body can handle about 10 to 12 hard sets of squats per week. You're probably not going to want to do that all in one day. 
So if you split up and squat maybe three times a week and divvy those up to three to four sets per day, lo and behold, you're probably going to be able to squat, uh, you know, 10 good hard sets of squats per week. Um, so it's, it's a volume amplifier, I guess you could say. It's a way to add volume to your program that doesn't cost you because you're doing so many sets on one given day. So that's one pro for squat frequency. Next thing is technical prowess. The more frequently you do a movement, the more f- the, the, the more you're going to learn the movement. This has been proven in our scientific literature. You can look at this for any sport-specific task. It doesn't matter if it's pitching, squatting, uh, throwing a football, you know, running a drill. It doesn't matter. All of it's the same. The more you do a task, the more you master that task. However, there is diminishing returns to some extent, and there can also be negative side effects when applied to our sport idea of powerlifting. So if you were to just squat really heavy all the time, you would obviously burn out fatigue and your squat form would go to trash because your muscles would be so fatigued. So you got to take that on a balancing spectrum. If you tip that balance too far one way or the other, you're probably not going to actually benefit from increasing frequency. But there is some idea to an extent, if you continuously increase frequency, you will get more technical gain out of it. Um, and then that's really the main two. I like to think there's a few other things with frequency. You could get very complex and talk about myonuclei if you believe in uh, myonuclear domain theory and some of those things, but those things are kind of debated. So I'm going to kind of leave the, all those things out of the conversation. We'll stick to squatting frequency and discussing uh, mainly volume and technique adaptation. So for me, I think of most people squat best when they squat two to three times per week. I've never really found outside of that realm to be that effective except for very, very rare circumstances. I have squatted myself five to six times per week running the Bulgarian method. That's a very hyper specific program to squatting. It has its pros. It has its cons. I did love it. I did enjoy it. I did get good results from it, but I also got plateaued from it a little bit when I started trying to do it too much. So again, diminishing returns and talking about negative side effects and whatnot. Is it really good to squat frequently? I would say yes, up to about two to three times per week. And then after that, the benefits start to uh, fade or you get negative benefits and you can't increase frequency much more without doing something really funky. Next question from Luke Rybar, 12. Would you ever consider training the Oli lifts? And if so, how would you program them with the power lifts? No, I would not myself personally. I think it will definitely interfere with your powerlifting training. I've seen a lot of people try to do this. My old friend Criselda tried to do this and then she just permanently switched over to Olympic lifting because she realized she couldn't really do both. I've had other friends do this as well and they usually always have to choose one or the other. My friend Shanette also did this. She was Both of them were extremely strong females in powerlifting and they decided to go towards Olympic lifting. For whatever reason, they found that stuff fun. I find Olympic lifting very boring uh, myself. It's just too reliant on technique. I think if maybe I learned from the time I was like 10, I'd probably like it more than powerlifting, but in this case, not so much. And I do think it'll interfere. If you really wanted to do it, what I would do is run a lower frequency powerlifting split three times per week and put your Olympic liftings uh, days on days in between and preferably trying to have one day where it's very spaced out with rest. So, you know, maybe train the Olympic lifts three times per week and train the power lifts three times per week, something like that. I'm no expert in programming the Olympic lifts, so I don't even know if that's you know applicable to their style of programming, but I do know powerlifting, you could make it down to a three-day split, still make some strength gains, and then maybe train the Olympic lifts three times per week. One of those days will have to fall on one of your training days with the power lifts, and the other two days could be on like a rest day, and that would probably be your best bet for doing it. S. Neal, this guy's been following me for a while. I recognize the name. I know you program beltless deadlifts, but what about beltless squats? Oh, God. I want to say yes to this, but I just honestly don't. So what I mean by that is I think beltless squats can have a purpose, but I really never program them. I haven't in years. Literally since 2017, I think, was the last time I programmed. I remember the last person I programmed beltless squats for, and they were actually naked squats, no knee sleeve, no belts. I just don't think outside of injury purposes, it's very practical if someone's goal is to gain as much strength as possible. However, there are some very unique circumstances where you could do that. And I also don't think it would necessarily be a detriment. Like I think you could, like I I could probably do my high bar day beltless and still get close to his maximum gains as I'm getting now. I think it would shave off maybe a little bit, but not much. I just, 
I guess what I'm saying is theoretically, there's some benefits there. Learning to centrate and stabilize your core without a belt is probably a good thing just from a neurological awareness standpoint. And kind of like the pragmatics of over-reliance on a belt, like building confidence where you feel like you can squat anything, anytime, anywhere. Whenever I ran Bulgarian Method, I did beltless um, squats myself, but that was more to limit load and stuff. But yeah, I just, I don't really actually program it if I'm being really honest. Like I have not programmed a single beltless squat except for in an injury situation since the year 2017, at least that I can remember off the top of my head. Next question from Cal, how to know when hook grip is right for you versus mixed grip on sumo? Talked about this earlier, um, reference back to earlier in the video. Um, okay, I don't know how to say this one. It's a bunch of fancy letters and stuff. X-O-R-D-U-S, uh, uppercase, lowercase stuff going on there. Uh, I probably sound like a dad. I would like to know how long can someone make progress with low repetitions and get stronger? Ooh, I like this question. Seems like some individuals have not that big amount of muscle mass, but are insanely strong. Is that genetics or can it be trained? I feel that wall, you put in quotes, after a few weeks when I do five by five, for example, I know exactly what you're talking about and I know exactly how you feel. So you might be shocked to find out these people who have very low amounts of muscle mass and usually tend to pull sumo. <clears throat> Sorry, I had something in the back of my throat there. Um, these people who have very low amounts of muscle mass and like to eat ass, they um, people are probably like, what? What is he talking about now? That's a joke. We say sumo pullers eat ass. Um, so they usually actually do train high reps. And the issue is, is oftentimes these people leverage themselves to a total. So you'll see someone with a really wide sumo stance pulling like, you know, toes to the plates and just using leverage to their advantage. You'll see them using a humongous arch, very max grip with bench press. Um, and so actually I would say even the people you see who have crazy leverage on a bar um, and are like very skinny, but like have huge totals, these people are more so a product of leverage rather than they're a product of just training low repetitions. So I actually know a lot of people who train mostly low repetitions, but have some good size on them. I wouldn't say completely low reps, but they do kind of do that. Now I would argue training high reps sometimes is just more efficient for putting on size. And I really do believe people should be squatting, benching and deadlifting their tens and twelves and eights and stuff. But um, I, I think your stimulus runs out. So going back to the conjugate method, if you just train low reps all the time, it's really easy to plateau. So I like training high reps, I like training moderate reps, I like training low reps because it feels like you're always making progress on something. So when I go to my quote unquote high rep phase, it's usually my hypertrophy work capacity phase. My heavy day is gonna be sets of fives to sixes. My moderate day is gonna be like eights to tens and I may even have some twelves and fifteens in there, especially on some of the accessory exercises like leg press or you know leg extensions, whatever. And so we're doing a lot of high reps on the main lifts and on accessory work and really the lowest all goes sets of five to six. When we're in a strength phase, we'll get hit up some singles, doubles, and triples, but we still keep in the moderate reps. So I wanna be clear about that is that when I say high reps, I mean high reps for the adaptation we are chasing. So strength adaptation high reps, in my opinion, is gonna be fives to sixes as where uh, strength peaking would be like ones to threes, if that makes sense. So like when you peak out, you need a lot of singles, doubles, and triples. When you're building strength foundation, you need a lot of fours, fives, and sixes, okay? And so these different phases, I like training and programming like that. You can not do that and still make progress, but I find progress stalls a lot easier when you constantly keep around those singles, doubles, and triples or moderate low reps all the time. Like I find getting out of different phases to really help. And I actually have seen a lot of behind the scenes of some of these lifters you're talking about and all jokes aside about sumo, I'm just ragging on you guys. Most of them are just leveraging themselves. There's even conventional pullers like this who just have dramatically long arms. A good example is um, Richard Hawthorne. His arms were like stupidly long and that's really what made his deadlift strong. You know, I hate to say it like that, but it's just the truth. You can leverage to a total. That's why when guys like Kaylor Wollum bench press, they impress me. So Kaylor Wollum's deadlift is impressive, sure, but his arms are crazy long. What's more impressive to me is his bench press. Like Kaylor Wollum's bench press is so insane compared to his deadlift to me because his arms are so damn long, yet his bench press is still really fucking strong. Like it's insane to me what he can bench. So that's really what you're noticing um, is more so, it's not that they're not doing high reps, it's that they're leveraging themselves to a total. 
Chris G asked, how does resensit? Oh, this is my client. This is uh, Chris Gao out there in Maryland. Uh, how does resensitizing a lift work? Why such power pivot blocks or deloads effective for changing the stimulus to a muscle? So resensitizing to a lift is really simple. You just basically do it and you build up the new neural or the, the rebuilding of new neurolog rebuilding of new rebuilding of neurological pathways and adaptations takes place. So what's happening is your brain is literally learning again or relearning to essentially coordinate the lift at hand. So if you're doing a low bar competition, heavy style squat, your brain is learning how to do that. And that's actually different than doing a low bar kind of lighter squat for sets of five to six. It's a very different task. Strength is highly specific, even down to the intensity zone. Now, while a comp squat for sets of five compared to a comp squat for a single is different, they're a lot more similar than say a high bar set of five compared to a comp squat single. So what you have to understand is the more you deviate away from your comp specific tasks, the more you're going to have to resensitize. So if you haven't been doing a lot of low bar and you also haven't been doing a lot of low reps, it's going to take you a while to refamiliarize yourself with um, comp specific movement, which is really heavy singles on the competition lips. Uh, so that's really which is what resensitizing is. Why and how are the pivot blocks uh, or deloads effective for changing stimulus to a muscle? So th this is actually huge and important to understand. So when you deload or do a pivot block, which is kind of like a deload where you like use alternate lifts to like just refreshing yourself, I guess you could say, um, or alternate like rep ranges and things of that nature. What you're doing is you're basically desensitizing your muscles to the stimulus you've been doing. So again, back to the ideas on conjugate, I actually think there's a lot of truth that you have to change stimulus up or accommodation really does take place. And so what a deload will do is, is not only does it make you fresh from a fatigue standpoint, but it desensitizes you, which is why you actually might find after a deload block that you come back week one and you feel a little out of groove still. Even though you feel fresh, you feel out of groove. Usually by week two, you feel a lot better because you're now starting to resensitize. So it kind of starts that process of, I guess, relearning everything and kind of getting stimulus to be fresh and new again to your body. And that's why it's really heavily important. And I could go on for an hour talking about that, but I'm trying to bang through these as quick as we can. Next question, Colin Browning. What are your thoughts slash opinions on the, oh, God damn it, on the conjugate method specifically for an intermediate lifter? God, you guys are obsessed with conjugate method. I have a feeling a lot of you guys are either watching maybe Jason or some of the other guys out there. Maybe Matt, that guy was mentioned earlier. I got to go check out some of their stuff. Um, again, I like conjugate, but it's not what I personally like to program. Um, it's me asked, that's their name. How should teens train? Is it okay for them to take caffeine every once in a while when on a plateau or should they buy any gear? Um, for example, belts, knee wraps, etc. Um, teens should train. I don't know why I, I've coached extremely strong teenagers. I had a 14 year old who, when she came to me, this was a very fun first experience for me. It was the first time I ever coached a teen. We got her squat bench and deadlift up to international elite level numbers for the open class um, in her weight class by the time she was 15 years old. So she was deadlifting, I think just under 400 pounds in the 130. God, what was the weight class at the time? I can't remember what it was because I think they were different. I, I would have to go back and look guys, but her name was Priscilla. She was deadlifting just, she was like 135 pounds in the off season, maybe like 130. Uh, she was um, deadlifting like just under 400. She was benching uh, 155, I think, which is insane at her age. And she was squatting, I think high 200s. Of course she was natural. She was a kid. I mean, unless she was getting fucking steroids from somewhere, which she wasn't. So um, she was incredibly strong. And I, I actually have researched to try to find her again because she ended up obviously not being able to afford this long term. She was younger. I actually gave her a huge deal because I was so enthused by this girl. I was charging her nothing to, to coach her. Um, but she got into, she actually got into Olympic lifts. And then I think some stuff with life happened. She had a little falling out with lifting. I've tried to find her again, actually, because I just want to see if she's this like crazy world record holder or something, you know, in some like Olympic lifting sport or something like that, that I'm unaware of. But um, yeah, no. So I coached this team lifter and we coached her exactly the way I coach my other guys. 
There's nothing different. There's this idea that you need to coach teams vastly different. What will be different is the technique cues, the um, focus on technique and form first, the focus on making sure they don't get injured. Those are going to be the most important things. So as long as that's in place, which that was a huge precedent, and as long as you know I got the okay from their parents, which I always made sure I did, and they signed off on the correct papers, I coached them basically the same. Now, as far as caffeine intake, I'll be very honest. I don't know what the scientific literature says on that. You should look into some research on that. You should look into what they recommend. I know I drank caffeine at that age. I had a cup of coffee almost every single day when I was that age. So I don't know if I'm more stupid or anything or just more goofy and weird because of it. But I'm actually not really sure. I've never looked at the caffeine uh, recommendations for teenagers. So I'd have to look into that, to be honest. Um, and then should you buy belts and not knee wraps, stay away from knee wraps. You get older. You just don't need that. They're very complex to use. You need to know how to wrap them. Use just belts, wrist wraps. Those are good. Go get those. Buy a good barbell too. Um, future IPF record breaker asked, are you a fan of bulking and cutting or main gaining? Uh, this is a great question. So, uh, <laughs> I, I love this guy's name. I like I like the confidence there. Future IPF record breaker. And are you a fan of main gaining or bulking or cutting? Um, so I like bulking and cutting a little bit more than I like main gaining. So I think main gaining is a very bad term. I, I side with the you know Mikey's retail take on this. I've heard a lot of people discuss this. Mike is retail and them recommend bulking up a little bit more and then cutting down. I think in my opinion, you have to do that. If you try to maintain it's kind of like keeping comp singles on your squad in the, the program year round. It's just, you, in my opinion, you get the worst of both worlds. It's like, don't be afraid to take a step away from competition leanness or your body weight um, competition uh, weight and, and just try to train hard in a bigger caloric surplus and then cut down a little bit as you need. And over the long term, I've personally found when I take that mindset of bulking and cutting, I gain more long term weight. When I took the approach of main gaining, I stayed fucking small for years and spun my wheels and got really injured because of it. So I personally don't like it. And I think most people who have that mindset usually aren't really main gaining. They're usually just maintaining or always constantly dieting, trying to keep their abs year round. And that's just not a good thing. So I think you should bulk and cut. Just don't get sloppy with it. Go go watch Mike Israel's recommendations. Pretty much what he recommends, I recommend. Um, I actually really agree with him on this one. Uh, ENT asked, do you recommend cardio while doing a power building slash powerlifting program? And what's the best kind of cardio that doesn't affect recovery as much? Yes, you can definitely and should be doing cardio. Low intensity steady state, hands down is going to be the best. Walking on an incline, going on a hike outside, getting your steps in daily, 10 to 15,000 steps a day would be great. Um, now, what the what kind of cardio is going to be invasive? Your your rowers, your bikes, and your like battle rope type stuff. I used to do a lot more of this. I've changed my stance on this a little bit. I do think it's a lot more invasive than I used to think. I stay away from most of that stuff now. I mainly just go outside and walk. The bike isn't as bad, but I found it really killed my quads out, especially when it was an assault bike. If it's a just normal resistance bike, it might be different, but definitely the assault bike is so intense on the quads. It was affecting my squat. Uh, Jordan Van Hygienigan. Oh God, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, assuming you're somewhere from that kind of maybe Western Europe region, uh, he asked, should you train your sticking points? And for example, should you train your triceps more if your lockout is the hardest part of your bench press? I've heard some, th some things of coaches saying this wouldn't help and others say it will work. Um, sorry, when I read you guys, the, the language throws me off sometimes, the little grammatical error. So anyway, should you train your sticking points? Um, no, not really. So yes and no. So what I mean by that is I analyze my deadlift. I realize I stick at my knee. But this idea that there's a magical muscle I need to train to fix this stick point at my knee or this very like I need to go do a bunch of block pulls, that is not the answer. Because when people think, okay, train your sticking points, they think, okay, train my top end strength on the deadlift or they think train my glutes. No, 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 no. Instead, examine why are you sticking there? Okay, for me, it's my back position bleeds off the floor in maximum pulls. And then the second thing is I was not aware of thrusting my glutes through enough at the top. How do I fix that? Pause deadlifts, maintaining back position very heavy and making sure I'm thrusting my glutes very forcefully through after the pause and also on my comp pulls. That's how I'm going to fix it. 
Other than that, my sticking point is more or less just my sticking points. So same thing on like a bench press. If you find you stick up top, let's examine the variables well. Usually when I find people stick at the lockout on bench press, it's not actually because of strength. It's either one, because that just happened to be perfectly too heavy to the point where you almost got it, but you just kind of gave out up top and it was just that hard. Or secondly, the main reason is probably because of stability in shoulder and scapula position. I find people who struggle staying tight, their elbows flare, the bar starts getting too linear and Sorry guys, the camera cut out. So anyway, as I was saying, the second reason why they might have a sticking point up top in the bench press is their scapula protracts, elbows flare out, and everything breaks down from a technical standpoint, and they get very linear on their bar path instead of kind of horizontal like it's supposed to be, and so they start pressing very vertically. So there could be other reasons as to why you're sticking in a bench press, but my point here being is like, now to train stability, that's gonna be training your scapula to remain in position. How do we do that? Larson press and scapula awareness, a lot of purposeful protracted, retracted cable rows, a lot of things with building connection to your scapula. So it's a lot different than what people think. It's not, okay, let me go do a three board press to work on my lockout. That's actually gonna do the opposite. You're probably gonna reinforce your bad habits because now you're just training protracted all the time. So should you train your sticking points? I guess kind of yes in a very complex way, but not the way you're thinking of. Um, now, will triceps carry over to your bench press? Yes, but is it gonna carry over to your lockout? No, that's not the way physiology and biomechanics work. So this idea that there's certain lockout muscle groups is not really that true. There's like some minor truth to it, but again, it's just a simplistic way of looking at it. Um, so yeah, I guess what I'm saying is if you're trying to train a block pole to fix your lockout on deadlifts, it's probably not gonna work unless that happened to magically also fix your positioning off the floor and some of the other things contributing to it. Odd, how do you say this? Adne Olin, I think that's how you say it. He asks, what do you do to prepare yourself the week before a big PR a lot? Um, first off, I'm resting and sleeping like crazy. I tell everyone in my family and household and like everyone around me, like, hey, leave me alone, <laughs> be nice to me. I'm going into hibernation mode. I try to recover, recuperate because I'm almost always doing some kind of taper. If I'm not doing a taper, I'm still doing the same habits that leave me set up for feeling good. And I start visualizing a lot. In fact, I'm visualizing like a month out, maybe even multiple months out of the big lifts coming. Right now with my meet coming in February, I'm just now about nine, eight weeks out. I'm starting to think about the platform. I'm literally picturing myself up there. I know that sounds kind of goofy, but these visualizations help me so much. I imagine myself doing the task. And I actually think that's hugely helpful from a mental standpoint. I, I bring to fruition this, is it, what I do is I create the picture in my head and then I make that happen. You know, I show up to the meet, I make it happen. I even go look at photos of where the meet's gonna be held. NAS Power is holding my meet uh, in Bakersfield. It's a gym. I go look, okay, what's the setup look like? I picture myself in the setup. It sounds crazy, but when you do this, I find it's like you show up to game day and you've already visualized yourself doing this a thousand times that you, it's so much easier to do now than if you just go about it and it hypes you up, it gets you fucking amped up. You know, you wanna go kill your PRs. Those are the main things. So I'm just basically doing recovery and I'm, I'm visualizing like crazy. And then lastly, I'll also add in there that um, I'm usually monitoring my weight and food intake the most during this time, but that's usually because I have to either make weight or even if I'm not making weight, I'm trying to bloat up. So I'm making sure at the right days, at the right times, my water levels, sodium levels, things like that are all in place. My carb levels, I'm recovering like crazy. I'm trying to do everything I can to maximize results. Um, next question, best psoas prehab exercise. I don't really believe in quote unquote prehab, but I, I get what you're saying. I don't mean to be that fucking annoying nuance coach who's like, bro, there's no such thing as prehabilitation, blah, blah, blah. Real prehab came from surgery. That's what like the nuance coach would say. So what? I know exactly what you mean. What's a good psoas drill to be, make you become more aware of your psoas? That's the way I would put it. How do we teach lifters to get stronger, more aware, and neurologically active psoas muscles to have carryover? Um, there's a few of them. A really good one my girlfriend has a, a video of on Instagram somewhere. I have no clue what to call this thing, but it's where you do kind of a plank on a bench or a medicine ball and do a hip march with it while locking out your glute at the top. It's, it's really hard to explain. You draw your core in. That's a really good one. Um, it's kind of like you're planking on something and then essentially doing like, like lifting one knee to the, the chest 
while the other glued is extending really hard and then you go back and forth and I really feel if you draw in nails that so as like crazy the other one I like are um, kettlebell or dumbbell to the ceiling sit-ups while drawing your core in so the so as is a hip flexor and it helps um, kind of tighten everything up, sucks it all up, so to say. So I focus on exercises where my core draws in and where I kind of flex at the hips. The other last one that I really like is going to be hanging leg raises, but done with a ton of tension. I'll probably do a video on this to really um, talk about this a little bit more because these are probably my favorite and they're kind of misunderstood exercises. I think a lot of people think they train other things, but they're really mostly so as exercises. So I'll do a video on that. Um, Adrian Franson asked, how do I decide which weight class to compete in? I'm currently 86 kilos at six feet and a little fluffier than I would want. I'm thinking a six foot lifter should ideally compete in 93 keys or more. Yes, you definitely long term will at least be 93 kilos. More than likely, if you're a high responder, you'll probably be a 105er. So I'm six foot. And if someone would have told me I'd be weighing over 200 pounds someday, I would have laughed at them. When I first started strength training, I was like 158 pounds, 156 pounds. I was really light, really skinny. I was emaciated. I was underfed. I was doing a bunch of starving diets. And the idea of being that heavy seemed impossible to me. And that actually limited myself. I went through a lot of main gaining phases early on where I was afraid to put on any kind of substantial body weight. The second I got rid of that mentality, I started gaining a lot more. So what I recommend to you is, and this is for everyone trying to play the weight class game gain up until you get too fluffy high end of your body fat set point and then cut down but then gain up again and next time you gain up you're probably going to pass that last point and then cut back down once you get too fluffy and then gain up again so it's going to work like peaks and valleys you're going to gain a little and then back down and gain a little and back down and over time you will settle into different weight classes until then do not worry about what weight class you show up on game day for if you are totaling under a 400 wilkes you should not be worrying about your weight class or if it's IPF points, I think that would be 500 IPF points. I still like never really think about things in IPF points. So off the top of my head, I, I can't even conceptualize what the equivalent of a 400 Wilkes is. I'm sure one of you smart guys can leave it down in the comment section below. But basically what I'm saying is, is like until you're around, you know, a good strength level, don't worry about your weight class. Just show up on game day in whatever weight class you fall into and make sure you keep bulking and cutting. And that's what I would recommend. Don't waste your time worrying about trying to make weight, especially on a two hour weigh in when you're like 86 kilos trying to cut down to 83, just focus on it. Now, if you happen to cut down because you're feeling too fluffy and you feel like you're at the top end of your body fat set point, gaining past that's not really gonna help you. You need to just cut down and if you get below 83 kilos, cool, do a meet and you can show up under 83 kilos, but don't try to force it. Make sure you just go in at whatever weight you're in. What you'll realize about world record holder, world, world record holding power lifters, sorry, talking by yourself for a long time is really hard. Um, what you'll notice about them is they're either heavily overweight or very, very lean. It's very rarely in between that. So they're almost always making huge weight cuts the night before a meet or they're like just way over weight class and they've built very heavy into it and they purposely can do that because at this point that helps them. For most beginners, you wanna stay away from those extremes. So until you're at that point, you shouldn't be doing either or of those scenarios. You should be bulking and cutting and just falling wherever you fall. Best accessory for the low bar squat if you have an upright squat form. I would just say more low bar squatting and belt squats and in some cases an SSB squats just because if they have really mess up shoulders and arms and um, oftentimes just Naturally, when I hear people say I have an upright squat, it's usually their natural squatters who have upright squats, but at max loads, their upper back kind of give. And if that's you, SSB is going to fix that. But generally speaking, just lower or, or more low bar squats, but for higher repetitions. This is something I see a lot of people afraid of using. Sets of eight to 10 on a low bar squat. Great, great secondary squat variation. I mean, I realize it's not a squat variation. I know you're looking for a different answer, but that I don't use a lot of variants for the squat. I go high bar. I go um, high bar, high bar pause, front squat, front squat paused, or tempo. Uh, tempo squats is another good variation. Actually, that's something you could definitely do, some good tempo squats. And then SSB squats, 
that's pretty much most of the tools in my arsenal for squat. I don't like to get too far out of there. Every once in a while, I'll use a double pause squat or something fancy, but those are always very unique situations. So unfortunately, you're a little limited, but that's that's a good thing. That's because all those work totally fine. You can just keep doing those. Um, Nadir Smith asks, how do you program back work? For example, lat pulldowns, pull-ups, et cetera, RPE, question mark. Um, I program it mainly higher reps, tens or higher. Usually I don't like too low of reps on there unless it's a bodybuilder more so. The reason why is you're already doing so many heavy deadlifts and heavy squats. You don't need a lot of low rep like pen lay rows or just things like that. I used to program more of those. They have their time and a place in an off season, but generally speaking, higher repetitions, RP is usually seven to 10 and it's, it's usually two times per week at minimum. And I, I, I do do a lot about back work. I've realized there's this very new like theme of coaches not doing a lot of back work in their programming and they argue it's because you don't need to. I think it's a very simplistic way of looking at it. I really think you want to maximize the thickness of your back so you have shorter ranges of motion on the bench because the more burly you are on the bench, the less range of motion you're going to have. And then likewise, it produces scapula awareness, strength, and stability. And then same thing with your vertical rows, like big lats are going to help you pull big deadlifts and bench with really good form. So I do a ton of back work twice a week at minimum, probably eight to 12 sets for most people, at least pretty much year round. That's how I do it. Um, Okay. Sunny Sandu asks, how do you choose what weight to put on the bar for certain RPE? For example, if you had sets of five at RP six, how would you choose between 180 and 182.5 kg? That, that This is what Greg's talking about. This, so this is what Greg means. There is no difference between 180 and 182.5 kg. If you're a female who's a world-class holding or world record holding world-class record holding bench presser, God, I need some more caffeine. Um, then maybe that two and a half kilos matters. But for everyone else, just choose either or. So like, don't worry about that too much. Two and a half kilos is just so little in that kind of, if, if you're talking 60 kilo bench on a female, okay, fine. Maybe we can play the two and a half kilo game, but you're talking 180 kilo lift, two and a half kilos ain't going to change anything. You just choose one of them. Like th- that's what Greg's saying is more or less, it's going to be the same RPE on the next set. So I would probably just opt for either the safer or harder version based on how you've been feeling lately. If you've been feeling kind of fresh and good, I would go for the harder version. And if you're feeling kind of shitty, I'll go for 180. But I I think in most of those scenarios, people are going to choose between 180 or 185 more so. And in that case, you just be smart, do the thing that you know you can do. And if anything, I usually recommend undershooting rather than overshooting because you can always come back next week and get a little bit more. Uh, opinion on using ammonia slash getting psyched up in training. This is actually a good question. So this was something I used to disagree with my current self on. So I used to think getting psyched up in training did not fatigue you that much. I used to think adrenal fatigue wasn't a thing. That's really not a thing. But what I mean is that I didn't think you could get fatigued in any way from psyching yourself up. And this is not true. The biggest thing I've changed in the last year is making sure I do not psych up too much on my secondary or tertiary days of lifting. When I do, I always get wrecked. I also don't program as many top sets on those days for squats or deads anymore because same thing, I would always get psyched up for them. It's very taxing on me because when you psych yourself up and use ammonia, the adrenaline rush you get allows for such a substantial more load on the bar that you're definitely going to get fatigued from there. So I'd recommend using it sparingly about one time per week is usually what I like to do. Sticking on your primary strength day with the big lifts. Um, That's when I'm going to get psyched up for training. John Larson my clients. He says, if I'm doing 30 sets of biceps per week and I want to get bigger biceps, should I hit up hit? Should I up it to 40 or 50 sets? Uh, I replied laughing my ass off. I'm gonna roast you again for this one, bro. If you keep this up, shakes my head. Um, so John is my client who came to me doing 30 sets on arms and he's just being a troll saying he wants to do 40 or 50 sets. Um, so no, but serious though, like John, his arms are growing like crazy. And guess what? Eight to 12 sets per week. The key is training hard and training purposefully. Again, RP is a tool and you have to use that tool responsibly and most people do not. So we just had to up his intensity on his arm training and we also just gave him a shit ton of heavy pressing because that's gonna build your arms a ton as well as doing some pushdowns and curls. You gotta have both in the program. Okay, Rick Stark asked, 
Have you ever seen a situation where shoulder mobility issue in one shoulder causes the bar to noticeably be uneven when squatting? It took took me for a while to diagnose the exact cause, but I had noticed for a long time that the bar would be a good two to four inches lower on one side. When I hit the bottom of the squat, the bar is pretty even in the standing position, but it leans very hard as I lower into the hole. Uh, it gets better when he widens his squat rip. Have I ever seen this? What do you specifically recommend to fix this? So usually this is an issue of trunk rotation. So if up top you're nice and even, but as you go down one bar side's leaning, usually what's actually happening is one side staying too rotated and extended and the other side's flexing and it looks like a lean to you. In reality, it's usually trunk rotational issues as well as hip rotational issues. It could also be a little something in in the the ankles or whatever, but I would take a look at your rotators, specifically your hips and your T-spine rotation. So not shoulders, but T-spine rotation. I'd probably start there and try to loosen those up and deduce that. And I also wouldn't be too freaked out about a little deviation as long as it doesn't stay around forever. I oftentimes squat with one foot slightly behind the other. Dan Green actually noticed it on me the other day and he told me he has the same problem. That spurs up when I get under fatigue. It's just part of the game sometimes. Fatigue will make your muscles kind of tight and restricted and then that will cause weird movement deviations. As long as you just stay on top of program management and don't over fatigue yourself, you'll be okay and it'll go away. Hamza Hamza Abdullah God I'm so sorry I'm fucking way too American for this I'm like butchering these names forgive me Hamza Abdullah I hope I'm saying that right Hamza Hamza I'm pl- I'm planning to try sumo for one training cycle since I've been training conventional all my life and see what my potential is with sumo how should I approach this since I'm guessing my adductors and groin etc are really weak so basically what are your recommendations when si- switching from conventional sumo this is actually a great uh, video my boy Jeremy Avila just did a video on Mark Belt's channel I think I think it's out there I know Jeremy told me he was doing this uh, so go check that out because this is actually a very underlooked thing you got to train your adductors to handle sumo a ton I've never had that issue but I know a lot of people whose adductors just don't do good with that really wide kind of abducted externally rotated stance so what I'm going to recommend is a ton of Copenhagen planks because they go hand in hand with your core sling so the oblique adductor sling which is heavily affecting um, your sumo deadlift so I'll do a lot of Copenhagen planks I'm definitely going to actually just train your adductors with very light sumos very strict form and ease your way into this so don't just go like like a lot of the time people are like okay let's see how heavy I can get on the sumo compared to my conventional don't do that literally like you'd be shocked just doing two to three plates or I don't I don't know what your max is but something that's like 50 60 percent of the load compared to your your conventional is plenty stimulation you don't need a lot start way less than you need and slowly build up your tolerance that is the most important thing you can do go watch jeremy's video he'll have a lot of information there um god we're almost done we're almost doing it b scott do you advocate the valsalva maneuver for beginner squatters using even using body weight only um I mean, oh, oh, maybe you mean body weight in the sense of like you're at one time body weight squat multiplier. I think that's what you mean because you're not going to need a Valsalva maneuver if you're air squatting. So I'm assuming you mean body weight uh, in total amount of, of multiplier on your back. So if you weigh 100 kilos, you mean 100 kilo squat. Um, do I recommend the Valsalva maneuver? Definitely. You should be learning that early on, master it before you get up to heavy loads because it'll be harder to master later on. See, the thing is, if you take a 500 pound squatter who's always squatted with overextension in his low back and has never properly learned to brace, reteaching him to brace is going to make him weaker and it's going to be such a more arduous task. If you teach a beginner, they just get stronger anyway. So it's way better to learn it when you're younger. Um... (laughs) Hold on. There's hella replies to this one. So Montel asked, he goes, this guy's got some jacked ass traps, man. Shout out, dude. This guy's got some big traps. I didn't see your picture before. So now I do know the answer to my question that I left. But he said, so I have made a bet with a friend that I would bench three plates by the end of the year. I estimate my current 1RM to be 130 to 135. Not an ideal situation, but what would be the best way to rush 
the strength gain. So when I first read this, I picture, again, I'm hell of American for this. I picture three plates being 315 and he's at 135 one plate bench. How is he going to get there uh, by the end of the year? He couldn't. But then I realized maybe he's talking about kilos and someone else asked this too. The next person said, I assume you're meaning 130 to 135 kilos. Eat a ton of food. Putting on weight helps the bench press so much. That's actually an accurate statement. And then I said, I'm praying you meant kilos. I will answer this one both for kilos and pounds. Ha, 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 ha. Because if it's pounds, I'm going to rant, but I'll keep it positive. And he said, ha, ha, it's kilos, man. So, so it is actually kilos. Um, if it was pounds, I would just call you delusional and just go home and, and drink your milk and, and do low bar squats with a very straight wrist. That's a rip a toe shout out. So no, man, if you really wanted to increase your bench as quick as possible, I'm not recommending you do this because it could backfire, but bench at a really high frequency. Um, if you don't know how to program, you could try small of junior. It actually does work. If, you, if you've only been benching twice a week, if you up your frequency to like four to five times a week, you're going to gain so much so quickly in that time period. Now, I don't know if you're going to get to three plates because I'm assuming you mean three 25 kilo plates on each side uh, by the end of the year. That That's a pretty steep, steep climb. I don't know if that's going to happen, but um, you could try to do that. And the best way you could do it is going to be basically to uh, just up your frequency like crazy, gain a bunch of weight, like they said, and <laughs> just fucking pray it happens and train your triceps really hard as well as um, some secondary lifts. So I'd probably recommend slowly upping your frequency week by week to about four to five times per week, you know, running a program that's really good and solid and sleeping and eating like crazy, gain a bunch of weight. That would be like, if you really want the answer as to how to do it in that time frame, that's your best chance. Other than that, you're honestly, if I'm being real, you're probably not gonna do it. Even if it's kilos, that's probably not gonna happen. But I commend you for trying. Last two questions, guys. Eric Lang, Ling, uh, Liang, L-I-A-N-G. Uh, is a peaking block necessary for intermediate lifters? I'm currently following your free DUP program, shout outs. And I'm considering to peak afterwards or repeat the block. I was wondering which one is more beneficial to strength in the long term. Um, yes, peaking is necessary for intermediate lifters. If I could go back and write that program with a peak, I would have. Back then, I didn't believe this, but I do now think that peaking is an integral part of gaining strength. I do believe you should always peak out at the end of a program. Maybe I'll go back and change that program. I don't know. Um, yeah, I would kind of have to rewrite the whole thing if I change it to peak. But the, the thing is, is that if you don't peak your strength out at the end of the program, it's actually harder to keep that strength gained when you go to the next program, in my opinion. You'll still keep it, but like it won't be as smooth of a transition than if you let off all that fatigue and really peak out and accentuate your strength. And then it'll also set you up for a better cycle in the long term. So what I would recommend is the last week deload. Um, shave off an extra couple of days off the program, skip like the last two or, or going into the last heavy day, I should say, take like an extra day or two off, just shave off one of those squat and uh, secondary days and one of the bench secondary days, completely skip them and try to peak out and hit a bigger number on that final uh, single day. I think it's at RP nine, if I remember correctly, and just try to essentially add as much load there and then take another few days off after that and then start a new block. I might go back and write an actual peaking block because I do honestly believe it's necessary. Okay, last question, Gunther. He asked, concept of grip width of the CIE of external rotation for conventional poles. I need to, I need to more internally rotate in order to not really bunch up and hit my legs. If I want to externally rotate, I have to grip pretty much snatch grip. Think Tom Martin is the only polar I've ever heard talking about the same and internally rotating himself. Never got how anyone would be able to externally rotate without extremely wide of a grip. Okay, I get what you're saying conceptually. I'm missing the term CIE of external rotation. Um, but, but essentially what he's saying is, He's, when he externally rotates inside his conventional pole, it bunch, I think he's saying it bunches up and his arms hit his legs. So you might be standing too wide, first of all. Um, second of all, if you're not, I know what you mean. I actually pull with my arms touching my legs. You just have to really work on your shoulder external rotation. But unfortunately, one thing I can say 
is what there's there's this thing called a carrying angle. So when you stand in anatomical neutral, that's basically thumbs towards the camera. Like if I was standing up, my thumbs would be this way. That's anatomical neutral. External rotation would be out here. So you see that angle that gets created right there when I externally rotate? That's what we call a carrying angle. And this is kind of usually where people should grip their squats and grip you know, various things of the nature. But your conventional poles, you usually try to grip a little bit narrower. That way the range of motion is a little shorter. But when you do this, it can mess up with your shoulder rotation slash um, you know, put risk on your bicep from kind of uh, getting too internally rotated in the shoulder joint. So what you're going to want to do is essentially um, kind of, I guess, like maneuver around the leg. So if you watch when I conventional pull, I stand a little bit more narrow and really rotate my feet in the ground. And that does budge my knees out. But when I go to grip the bar, even though my carrying angle kind of causes my forearms to hit my legs, I essentially just grip around that and kind of force my knees into my arms a little bit and I just kind of put pressure there but I just make sure my shoulders are externally rotated and even though it kind of feels a little uncomfortable and looks weird that's essentially how I get around it so I think that's what you meant with the question um, now if you're someone who has a humongous carrying angle and your elbows like way in but your grips way wide then in that case you might have to think about hook grip that might be the smarter ploy there so you could implement hook grip to kind of get around that if that's the case but guys that is the q and a I'm sweaty because it's hot in here from the studio lights. Sun's going down. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. So I hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A. Very difficult to talk for this long. You would be shocked. So uh, give the video a thumbs up for me. Comment down below. I'm going to see you guys in the next video. I'm out of here.